Good morning, Highland Church. Good to see you. Good to see everyone. Uh Uh-oh. Cross is out today. Somebody's in trouble. Hey, we are in an abbreviated series just walking through some passages in the book of Colossians. Uh, We've done it the last three weeks. I was going to take the next passage this week before there's another amazing series starting next week. And I was reading before and after the passage I was supposed to preach. Trying to get some context, read the passage next, and I talked to Pastor Ari last week. I'm like, can I skip the passage I was going to do and do that one instead? And he let me do it. So, you know, we're, we're not walking orderly through this book because we're finishing up today. So maybe that means we're going liberal, but we're going to preach the text and we're going after today. And we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just dive right in. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. If you're going through your Bible, you're in the New Testament, you've got your Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you've got the book of Acts then Romans, then 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then these four little, little books. You heard me say this before, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I paid $30,000 at seminary to have a way to remember that. <laughs> Greeks eat pork chops. Yes. So, Greeks eat pork chops. So if you ever want to know the order of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, remember that Greeks eat pork chops. We're in the chop today, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. Let's go. Here we go. I want you to stand with me while I read God's word. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen? Let me pray for you. God, this is action-packed today, Lord. So uh, would your spirit speak to those who are here Lord, just anyone who's overwhelmed by the weight of their sin, in Christ Jesus, you have blotted that out for eternity. And you have nailed that record to the cross. And so I pray freedom in Jesus' name for every single man, woman, boy, and girl in this room today. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. Amen. Let's have a seat. So if you were here with us last few weeks, you know, Paul is primarily, by the way, if you're here, you don't get to look at me today. This is my grace to you. What's up? How you doing? (laughs) Paul's very concerned that false teachers are distracting this church with very attractive teaching from the pure hope of the gospel. And that happened then and it happens today. People come with very attractive philosophies and religious promises that are counter to scripture. They distract Christians and non-Christians alike and draw them away from being firmly planted in the hope of Jesus Christ. And Paul's concerned for that today as he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're concerned about that for our church. We're going to equip our church to not live like that, to walk in Christ, in Christ alone. So, therefore, verse 6, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. The therefore in that verse points back to everything that's come before in the first chapter and the first five verses of Colossians chapter 2. And it's basically Paul saying, you've been saved by Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget it. No one can shake you from that. No matter who comes and tries to tell you something else, remember the gospel, remember your salvation, remember the hope that's stored up for you in eternity. Now live like it. He says, I want you to be rooted and built up and established. The rooted part made me think of, uh, that that means planted firmly, right? Your roots, it's it's this, this, think of like deep going roots of a plant. 
And we have an amazing leader in our church named Patty Roney, who's led a group four times since the beginning of this year called Rooted. 85 women have gone through that so far. Almost a dozen baptized, either directly as part of the class or family members from the class. She's been leading it. She's leaving to go back to SoCal, Arizona. I'm not sure. We don't care. We just want her back. In January, she's going to start it again. Um, But I just think about the faithful service she's provided to dozens of women in this church. And Patty, forgiveness, not permission, can we just celebrate you for that? Would you mind standing really quick? This is Patty Roney. The whole purpose of that class is to do what this passage is talking about, to help people be planted firmly in their faith. And then Paul's going to switch metaphors on us. He's going to be talking about built up. Not, it's a construction metaphor. Not only are we planted deeply with deep roots, but we're this, also this project that's continually under construction as God builds up a strong edifice of our faith. Anybody here feel like they're under construction? Come on. And then he also talks about being established in our faith, understanding what it means to be a Christian, resting on that, just like we were taught the pure teachings of the church. And that's what he wants for us. That's what God wants for us, to be rooted, to be built up, and to be established. And here's the thing. There are people and cults and agendas out there that are trying to steal that from you and if you don't know and you're not wise and you give in to them, they can, they can make a shipwreck of your faith. And so we're not going to do that. Paul's not going to allow that to happen. We're not going to allow that to happen. We're going to be firmly planted. We're going to be built up and established in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. Amen? So the next verse, he says, Now see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. <clears throat> According to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. This, Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, this passage really communicates Paul's primary concern on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for writing this message. He's concerned because there's a teaching in this church, around this church, either internally or externally by people who have, have got this, he, he uses the term philosophy. He's not saying that all philosophy is bad here. Think like philosophical or religious system of beliefs that you order your life around. That's what he's talking about. And people have come in and they're trying to teach this. And there's two remarkable parts. He doesn't, the, the, the book doesn't really explain every specific of what this teaching was that was going on in this uh, town called Colossae. But there's two things we know. It was based upon tradition. And it was also based upon the adherence to or potentially worship of, at best, created things, at worst, satanic forces. And there's a, there's a lot of debate around what Paul's saying here as far as what, but, but it's somewhere on that spectrum. Tradition and worship of created things instead of the creator. I'm glad we don't struggle with that in the church today at all. Let's talk about tradition. Uh, this was in the Greek society that was so, they were so passionate for knowledge and wisdom. If someone came along with a religious system that was based upon adherence to like ancestral traditions, that would have been very attractive to them. Because they would have thought that was very compelling, like there was something that was built. Because they were always seeking wisdom and wisdom of previous generations. For us, it's a little bit different sometimes. We're, we're more addicted to the new thing, right? You know, whether it's the new phone, the new fashion, the new reality TV show. Did I go too far? I still can't believe Devin made it that far. If you know, you know. We love the new thing. Right? And so if someone would come along to us with this newfangled, new age belief system is very attractive, that would be compelling to us, wouldn't it? And then somehow, some way, we always trip over into loving our traditions. Church is so good at that. If you're at this church or any other church and you ask someone, why do we do it like that? And the answer becomes less and less because the Bible says and becomes more and more because we've always done it that way. Welcome to tradition. And we're all susceptible to it. And then the worship of created things. Once again, we're not sure we're on a spectrum here. It's either uh, some type of created entity or object, or it could be even like spirits that they're worshiping, angels and probably demons. Um, We are designed to worship. And so often I've seen so many Christians trade the worship of the creator for the worship of a created thing. We're using this cross as a prop today for our message. 
And I love that. But I also get a little scared. Because I've just seen stuff like this, people attach their hearts to, and you always know, because if you move it off the stage, all of a sudden you're in conflict because people are worshiping props instead of worshiping the creator who created all this. We're so good at this. Think of the golden calf. I mean, like as soon as Moses was on the mountain, they made an object of created things to worship instead of worshiping the creator who created it all. And that's what God wants to draw us to. I've seen so many things like this that I'm a little jaded, i can be honest with you. I did an interim lead pastor gig at a church over in Washington State. And by the time I got there, they were worshiping everything but Jesus, and it was so bad. Generations of organs and pianos and all the worship of the instruments. <clears throat> they had a really high ceiling in the sanctuary with these two big stained glass windows that when they constructed it, they didn't think about the angle of the sun at the general time of service. So when service would happen for the first couple of years that they had these stained glass windows, it just so happened that the sun was coming right through and just blinding people in the congregation. So what did they do? They filled it in. They closed it off. So there's no real light behind it. It's basically a box with a stained glass window. They put fake lights in there. They were on a dimmer that was controlled in the tech booth. By the time I got there, literally, people would walk up and yell at the person in the tech booth because they didn't have the dimmer set to what they perceive as the appropriate amount of light, the fake light coming through the stained glass window, and they're yelling at someone. I was just at a church this week, and great church, different state. They were giving me a tour of a facility, huge facility, lots of rooms. And the facilities guy that's giving me a tour, I'm telling you, like every third room, there was something from a generation that was put in there not to be touched ever until certain people died. So they had the, the former kids' check-in kiosk was in a room because someone had built it. They haven't used it for years. It's in a room. They had this, they had, they'd done this big mural in service, like painted this picture of Jesus on these three huge boards. It was just lining a hallway, like way up on the third floor somewhere. It was super hot. Not getting rid of that. There was, they used to do like 100-person orchestra sets, and there were rooms, rooms of racks of white boxes of sheet music, like, like hundreds of boxes just lining the walls. We go in another room, and there's more boxes and more boxes. We don't get rid of them because whoever's a part of the orchestra would come after us. We're designed to worship. The question is, what will we worship? And Paul's concerned because this specific false religion is focused on traditions, very attractive, and some type of worship of other objects that he calls the elemental spirits of this world. At best, again, something like what I mentioned, at worst, some type of angelic or satanic beings. And he's trying to correct them from that and move them to something that's even more attractive, which is the gospel of Jesus. Some of you have come in here today with empty souls. And you're looking, you're just hungry for something to fill it. And there's so many attractive false religions out there that will attempt to do that for you. But I know with all my heart that there is nothing more attractive to the thirsty soul than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul's going to give them just a few of the, the greatest hits of the gospel now. Because they've been tempted to follow this. And I was like, let me show you what you could be doing and could be worshiping. Let me remind you of some things. Let's talk about verse 9. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. First thing that is attractive about our faith is the God of the universe that created all all of this, when Jesus came to earth, the fullness of that was present in Jesus Christ. God himself, the power that created the universe, that dwelt in Christ as he walked this earth and accomplished salvation on our behalf. Now, that's a better God to worship than all these false ones, isn't it? And he says, and if you are here and you're in Christ, the God who came to this earth, second person of the Trinity was filled with all the fullness of God. You're filled in him. 
And some of us are seeking to fill voids in our lives, whether we're Christian or not, with all kinds of things, aren't we? There's all kinds of things we, 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 we go to to fill us. Even as Christians, we do that. Even though the Bible says that God, by the Spirit of God, fills us to overflowing, we, I, just, I don't know about you, but I forget it. I take my eyes off it, stop focusing on it, and I need other things to make me happy and make me smile. And God says, don't ever forget. God himself came to earth for you and now fills you to overflowing. And that's available to you. And these false religions can't touch that. And the whole rule and authority, I'm going to come back to that. We'll talk about that in a second. And then verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God <clears throat> who raised him from the dead. Okay, this one's debated. What is Paul actually saying here? I'm just going to take my best shot at it, so stay with me. First of all, circumcision. If you don't know, Google it. I'm not describing it. If you're, ask your parents. If you're here and you're male and you don't know, you probably know. As far as I'm going. For the Jew in the first century, that physical, specific thing. I can't, I was, even, even I was like, like practicing the message, I couldn't not chop. Okay, so that thing was the defining visible attribute of their faith, and they were so proud of it. Uh, one commentary writer states this, <clears throat> for most Jews in the first century, Circumcision had become the fundamental identity badge for membership in God's people. In times of persecution, Jews regarded it as a confession of faith as well as an act of obedience to God's holy law. It was the defining characteristic of their identity, of their religion, and they were super proud of it. And I just don't know how they ever like, proved to one another that like, you're in. I still don't get that. I just got to take, I'm taking your word for it. And part of this teaching, it seems like, maybe it was like a, you know, ethnic Jewish historical tradition, maybe that was part of it. And so that was very attractive. They're saying, hey, if you want to have identity in your faith, circumcision is the way to go, man. And Paul's going to say, you want an identity badge? Try this one on for size. <clears throat> The God of the universe loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to earth, born into humanity with all the fullness of God himself. God sent him to die a brutal death on the cross, mocked and tortured, then mocked and tortured some more, slapped, whipped, spit on, beard ripped out, crown of thorns smashed on his head, forced to walk up a hill carrying the cross on which he'd be crucified, mocked the entire way, nailed to the cross by his wrists and ankles, hung on it off the ground so that each breath drawn would be torturous, left there to die of his own suffocation, and even worse, the wrath of God against the sin of all mankind resting on his holy shoulders while he was there. Hanging there on the cross, he gave up his life and died for you. And when you placed your faith in Christ, and when I placed my faith in Christ, that became our identity. The old you was buried, dead and gone, as evidenced by the obedient step of baptism. You were raised to new life in Christ by the powerful hand of God, just like Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Your new spiritual life came to be. And you want to know your identity? You want to know something you can, you can proudly identify with and say, that's who I am. Forget circumcision of the flesh. You know what sets us apart? Jesus. Jesus crucified, died, buried, resurrected, 
ascended, and coming again. That's my badge. And that's your badge. And that's way better than... (laughs) (laughs) And seriously, that truth, that identity is better than any man-made religion could ever offer you. And it's there waiting for you. Whether you've never been, put your faith in Christ, you can have that identity today. And sometimes even as Christians, we forget, don't we? And things get a little empty. Don't forget who your identity is and what your circumcision is. Okay, I'd like you guys to speak this next verse with me. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Having what? Forgiven us, how many? All our trespasses. You know, forgiveness is a rare thing, isn't it? You don't see it too often in this world. This world, it kind of categorically in all the systems of this world, it seems to be wired to never forgive and never forget. Last time I was up here, I uh, communicated to you how excellent a driver I am. When I was going to be the lead pastor of that church in Washington on an interim basis, what I, the, the rhythm was I would fly out for every two weeks, spend time with the staff and team there, preach a little bit, come back home here to Wyoming, rinse and repeat for 10 months. And so one of the elders of that church allowed me to have the, the exclusive use of one of his vehicles while I was there to, uh, to, to make sure that everything was copacetic with insurance. He needed my driving record to provide to his insurance company so that I could regularly drive his vehicle. So I went to the DMV up there where they're all for you places. Is that where it's still at? Yeah, because yeah, it's it a couple year, few years ago. <laughs> excited to walk in there because I'm an excellent driver. And I was excited to get my driving record and provide that to him. So I paid for the printout. I grabbed the, the driving record. I walked out of the DMV, took about three steps in the park, and I looked down, and right there on it said, Convicted. And my whole body went numb. Look, convicted. Like I, I can see, like, I was so freaked out because I'm thinking, I don't know what I was convicted of, but I got to send this to an elder of the church where I'm lead pastor and I've been convicted. <laughs> I literally was just in such a stunned daze. I walked up to the wrong truck and tried to get in it. <laughs> this could have been a short story because I could have been shot. Like I'm just like, and then looking like, oh, that's not my, that's not my Ford. Like my Ford's over there. So, 15 years ago, a different decade, two, di- two different decades ago, I think, different decade, we moved here from California to plant a church. And if you ever moved interstate, it's expensive. You've got to change all this stuff, including the registration of a vehicle. And I'm like, I'm just going to let that play out because I was, I was, you know, I was barely making enough to, to feed the family. I'm like, I'm just going like, to let that play out for as many days as I can. And I forgot about it. And I'm driving to Powell, and there's always those highway patrol out there, man. They got me. They pulled me over, expired registration, and on that record was the date, time, and offense of when I was convicted. (laughs) Has nothing to do with my driving, by the way. I'm still an excellent driver. (laughs) Record. It doesn't forget, does it? All those years, still there. What about our sin? What's that record look like? How long is that list? For me, it wouldn't be a one-pager. I'm just going to go first person here. It would look something like this. And I haven't practiced this, and Meredith, I'm sorry. I don't know how this is going to go. (laughs) That went okay. That's this morning for me, right? Disobedient to God's commands in action, speech, thought. That, for, I don't know about you, but that's just me 
before I even have coffee in the morning. And then I just pick up steam. What about you? How long a conviction record are we talking? I did some math here, just to give an example. Okay. If one of us, any of us, violated God's commands in action, speech, or thought 20 times a day, 20 times a day, that's not, I'm not even out of bed yet, being gracious, okay, times 365 times seven years of living, 511,000, 20 times a day, that's not even counting for leap years, grace poured over February 29th, I'm not even counting, <laughs> you guys are off the hook, man, for me, it's more than that, anyone else, a hundred times a day, Violation of God's commands in action, thought, speech. The thought one gets you, doesn't it? That's a big deal. Thought life matters. Just 100 times a day times 365 times 70 years, 2,555,000 convictions. And you have, we have to understand that God as the creator of the universe, has the cosmological right to say what is true, what is false, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. And I would even say that because he has defined himself as a just God, he not only has the cosmological right, you could even say he has a cosmological obligation per his identity that he's communicated to judge all of that or he's not just and I don't know about you but sometimes it's easier for me to think of someone else's list than to turn that mirror on me and think about my list just a hundred times a day I'm way beyond that I've got two million five hundred thousand plus convictions on my record I don't know about you but I can't work my way out of that can you? And yet, it says, he's forgiven us all our trespasses. How has he done that? Let's read this through verse 13 and 14 again. Let's try this. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses, next verse, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with, the legal, with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing to the cross. Does anyone here have a King James or New King James that they're, they're reading from today? Would you be willing to read that verse in, which one, you got New King James or King James? King James, can you, you read it for, project your voice for me a little bit? Blotting it out. The new King James says, wiping it away. Because you see, they didn't have typewriters back then. They have computers. This list of our debts would have been in written format on some type of parchment, yes? That word is only used five times in Scripture. The blotting out, the ESV reads canceling. And it's beautiful every time it's used. I just want to read this to you. It's used once in Acts, once here, and three times in the book of Revelation. Book of Acts, Peter's preaching his second message in Acts chapter 3. It says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Come on. It's recorded here. And then in Revelation chapter 3, chapter 7, and chapter 21. Chapter 3 is exhorting the church of Sardis. This is actually kind of the negative side of this. He will not blot out. He says, The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. 
in Revelation chapter 7, speaking of those who have come out of the great tribulation. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then once more, Revelation 21, the new heaven, new earth, what eternity is going to look like. It's a little bit longer, but I just want to read it over you. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Five times it's used. You know one of the things that moves me? There's so much there, but one of the things that moves me about that? It seems like when God starts wiping things away, they don't come back. They're, it's the type of wiping away that they're gone. Both times in Revelation, when he's using this about wiping away tears, it's in the context of you will never cry those tears again. Pain, death, sorrow are gone, and now I'm wiping away your tears that you will never cry again. And as we look at our sin. And what God's done with our sin, it's the same God and the same verb. And it's gone. It's gone. It's not that you've just been forgiven of everything you've done, past, present, and future. The record in God's eyes is gone. It's been wiped clean completely as if it never existed. And even the parchment has been handled. Go back to the verse. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I was sharing this this morning. We pray, by the way, we pray, we pray together at 915 for our service. If you'd ever like to come join us, we'd love you to do that. Um, this imagery, can you imagine if you looked at the cross? And it wasn't just a cross sitting here. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that had placed their faith in Christ, that had had this record of millions of convictions wiped clean, that empty parchment that would be, for me, miles long, was nailed to the cross for every single man, woman, boy, and girl that had ever placed their faith in Christ. Can you imagine that? And that's what he's done for us. And that's what he's offered to us. So, I want to give us a little time to reflect. The Bible says that in Christ, your sins just haven't been forgiven. The record's been wiped clean. And some of you have come in here today with a record that has not yet wiped clean. And I just want to give you the opportunity to address that with Jesus. Uh, in each of your seat backs... There are these three by five cards. And if you're out in the lobby, there are some on the tables out there with pens. Each of you has an opportunity, if you so will, to put this into practice today before we close. For those of you who are here who are still far from God, you have this record of sin that you can't pay for. Jesus today will wipe it clean. If you place your faith in him and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you and save you, He'll do it today. And your record will be nailed to the cross. Blank record. But it'll be hanging there with all the rest of us as we walk in freedom. And if you want to, and if that's you and today's your day, then just take that little three or five card and just put Jesus, save me. Fold it up. Bring it up. And there's hammers and nails right here nailed to the cross because that's where it belongs. Some of you are in here 
You've placed your faith in Christ. Your record has been wiped clean. Do you understand? In God's eyes, it does not exist. It's inaccessible. And even though you've turned from those things, you're still living in shame and bondage for the things that you did. And Christ wants to offer you freedom to that. To walk away from it because it's not there anymore. When you accepted Christ, it disappeared. And some of us still have those things. Because it was bad, wasn't it? It was tough. We messed up. We hurt people. We've received forgiveness of Christ. And it's gone. So why are you letting it hold you in bondage? Of shame and guilt. What is it? What is that thing? An opportunity to write that down. Fold it up. Bring it up. Nail it to the cross. Walk away from it. Some of us are here and Jesus is our Lord and Savior and still there's this thing that we're doing. This thing, this sin that we're battling. And God wants, eternally it's been handled. You understand that? Though you still wrestle, eternally it's gone. In God's cosmic viewpoint, it's been wiped clean. That doesn't mean we don't struggle. That's why he says he's going to wipe away tears. But today you came in here struggling with something. This is between you and Jesus Christ. Eternally, you're good. But your relationship with Christ, your thanksgiving, your joy has gone right out the window because this thing just gets you. What is it? Take a little three by five card. Write it down. Receive the forgiveness that Christ offers. The restored relationship. Come up. Nail it to the cross. Walk away from it. This is the time for you. You and Jesus. Those things that are written there, hear me now, will never be read by anyone. Anyone. I promise you that, if you trust me. They will disappear. No one will look at them. Because they're already gone anyway. So, let's take a little time. Anyone who wants to do that, cross is here. Three by five cards. It's for you. Anybody hit a thumb? It's Wyoming tough right there. One more verse. Verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. And I love that because these rulers and principalities that hold so much sway over the people in the world outside of Jesus that cause us to live in shame and bondage and regret and guilt and all those things. Jesus in his work, one of the last things that's attractive about the gospel is in the cosmos they're being ridiculed now because they have no power left. Jesus through his work on the cross took all dominion and authority from them and he said those that are in Christ are mine and you can't touch them because they belong to me now and their records have been wiped clean so some of us still struggle and that's the struggle that we'll face as we pursue Christ until he takes us home but don't think that your attorney's at stake ever Jesus handled that for you and one day though we still wrestle in the same way that he wiped away our sins he will wipe away every tear we've ever cried and will never cry another one again. Because you have been rooted, built up, and established in your faith. Because the God who saved you, the Savior who came to earth, had the entire deity, the universal power of God at his disposal when he used it for you. And now our identity is in his death his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and he's coming back. And that's, our, that's who we are and whose we are. And we've been forgiven everything. It's been wiped clean and nailed to the cross. Amen? Okay, let me pray for you and let's thank him. God, thank you for the freedom available in your cross, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Even when we hated you, you loved us first and accomplished salvation for us. I can't wrap my head around it. I, I can't 
imagine the number of ways that I've disobeyed you in thought, action, speech, millions and millions and millions of times. And you don't even see it anymore because you wiped it clean. Lord, that just overwhelm our souls. Give us the power to walk at least another week towards you. Would this church be planted with deep roots, be built on the foundation of your gospel and the teachings of the word, would be established in our faith and unswervable, and we'll know it because thanksgiving will abound. So let's give you thanks now for all you've done and more, and even more than that, just who you are, our great God and Savior, Jesus.